So that's the old music again, and there's a reason why we started the show with the old music. Uh, for those who followed the uh, podcast for any significant period of time, uh, that is How Hard I Try from uh, Ball and Chain. That's and right. it just so happens that the man behind that original music, Charles Bunce, is here with us. Ah. Hello. Uh, yes, and uh, uh, that's because he has produced a film that we're actually talking about this week on the, on the podcast. So when he's gone, we will slam it. <laughs> um, the uh, the film is The Black String with Frankie Muniz. Charles, welcome. Thank you. And your director, Brian Hansen, is with us by phone. Brian? I'm here, thanks. Thanks yeah. for having me, guys. Absolutely. Uh, and, and a quick little also backdrop here. So uh, Charles also runs the film department at Mount St. Mary's uh, University, where I have taught and where Tim teaches. Yes. I and, love that university. And, uh, and is this like our disclaimer where we say how we all know each other? Yeah. And okay. I was going to, you know, you, where did you begin working on movies, Charles? Well, funny you should ask. <laughs> so growing up, I got into film. Wade had a huge impact on my uh, kind of love of movies. And um, my first quote unquote real films that I worked on were Wade at uh, UCLA oh my gosh. Film School. And my first uh, brush with what would become. Um, Kind of, I guess, film celebrity with J.J. Abrams yeah. on the, uh, the Mr. Petrified Forest. Yeah, Mr. Petrified Matt, Forest. Matt Reeves film. Yeah, yeah. Which, which it, it's kind of weird where everybody's gone. Uh, Matt's doing a Batman film, and J.J. rules the universe. And uh, and and for some reason, I'm here talking into a microphone. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, so um, let's 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 talk about the Black String, which just won some awards. Yeah, I'm gonna let Brian take that. Do you want to do you want to to- toot your own horn, Brian? Well, we, we've been doing our festival kind of circuit before the release on uh, Tuesday nine twenty four. so we're trying to cram it all in there. And the team's been flying around the country to, to attend. You know, everyone's got to go to a different festival because sometimes they're landing on the same weekend. So last weekend, we had uh, Charles and Kaylee, for two, another one of our producers, and uh, Chelsea, our actress, and Blake, our actor, went out to... Um, uh, Film Quest in Utah, Provo, Utah. Very great, a really cool like genre fest. And Frankie Muniz won Best Actor there. And um, at the same time, I was in Atlanta for the Atlanta Horror Film Festival, which is part of the Atlanta Film Series. And there we won Best Feature, and then I won Best Director. So it was a um, it was a great weekend for the Black String. That's Congratulations! Terrific. That's fantastic. That is fantastic. Tell, tell us a little bit about the movie. What's the, what's what's the movie? The, I, I think we know the genre and whatnot, but uh, walk us through it. What the hell's going on? The best the best way that I can summarize it is it's a you know it's a Rosemary's Baby type movie or a Jacob's Ladder or Black Swan where you're watching this protagonist in our case it's Frankie Muniz, a kind of lonely Seven Eleven cashier stuck in the suburbs, never left his hometown after high school. And he's, he, you can tell that he's, he's damaged in some way, he's very lonely, isolated, um, and there's some sort of trauma in his past that his friends and family seem to allude to. We don't quite know what it is. Um, and he's so lonely that he calls a 1-900 number one night, like adult chat line, leads to a blind date with this beautiful girl, mysterious girl, and uh, they go on this blind date, she disappears, and he starts to obsess and become very paranoid because he gets ill after their, their, you know, blind date. So he thinks, here's the Rosemary's Baby part. He thinks, wow, I've been set up. I think there's something, you know, occultish going on, and I'm, I'm the target. Some sinister plot, and everyone in his life saying, no, you're having problems again. You know, it's time to take the medicine and talk to psychiatrists. So it's one of those kind of a double-sided coin um, is this mental illness, or is he really being targeted by like this sinister occult plot? It is. Uh, I have to say, you guys pulled an amazing amount of production value out of what you had. It, there are some. There are films that are substantially higher budget that do not have the level of effects that you guys got out of this. It was really, really very effective. Thank you. Talk, talk about um, approaching it from a logistical standpoint. It's not like you've got Paramount behind you and, and writing you a big check and, and saying, you know, make 
we, we want it to be a paranormal activity and look low budget, but we'll write you an $80 million check if you need. You guys had, you know, you had limitations. How do you work with those and get the most out of your production value? Well, well half of it is definitely, you know, Charles Bunce can talk about how much Mount St. Mary's really supported the film. Um, but outside of Mount St. Mary's, it was really calling in favors. We did um, a mentor of ours, Mark Solaroff, who teaches. He's a producer, but also has this no-budget film school. And he really taught us the, that micro-budget approach, like you got to shoot with what you've got. You know? So believe it or not, we looked around, and we, we looked at our scripts. It was like, my God, we have so many locations. This is not that, like, one haunted house out in the woods or grandma's attic, you know, let's uh, shoot here with two characters. That's the smart thing to do. We had, <laughs> 20, 25, we had 25 characters and 13 locations, and part of it is we didn't know how rough that was going to be, but believe it or not, 90% of those are, like, a friend's house um, and or, like, a, a really cool location spot that had deals for student filmmakers because um, we were shooting this as a student thesis as well. It kind of morphed and got bigger, but um, it, it was it was just a lot of favors and a lot of cool people, but Bunce uh, can definitely tell you how much Mount St. Mary's helped out. Yeah, I mean, as a, as a department, um, we were able to use, we used a lot of uh, location shooting on campus, and so we had a lot of stuff, things that you wouldn't necessarily like expect was the campus, but we also... Uh, at one point, Frankie's character ends up in a mental institution, and so you know, Mount St. Mary's, our Shalon campus up in Brentwood, um, at, it, it debuted, I think, as a mental institution in um, Mel Brooks' uh, High Anxiety. Oh, yeah. So you know, we were we were tapping its roots, you know, going going back there, uh, and so we had a lot of great like location support. Um, uh, the department was able, the film department was able to to lend some uh, some equipment support. So things I think where. Normally, more money would have been going out. We were able to save that money and put that money in other places because of the, the access and resources we had as, as students and being part of the school. And I can tell you that the, the production value that you get, because uh, uh, Charles was also wonderful in lending a big chunk of that campus to my production, and production value is an insane thing, particularly when you don't have to pay for it. Uh, uh, and, uh, and it really just sort of ups the production value of everything. Uh, that's a $100,000 day shooting on that campus. In, a, in an ordinary sort of studio circumstance, that's a $100,000 day. So when you take your film out there into the world, you start at $100,000. You've got the, got the guy this thing. Uh, and you work your way up from there. And just as a plug, right, if you enroll in our programs, you get that access. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> I, I, that's good. Yeah. yeah. The, so I want to know from each of you what was the what was the most difficult part of this film that you did not foresee, both as a director and a producer. Oh man, you you go yeah. first. Yeah. Yeah. There there was there was definitely um, you know the, on the production part where we had we had you know our challenges, but the post then had its own challenges. Yeah. Charles has has uh we, charles and i and, and kelby have spent some some long long hours um getting our hands like digging into into technical things we never thought we'd have to explore before but during i say during production the one day that really stands out is um the string pull we call it up at blue high shack when frankie's pulling the string out of his arm and but we also shot him walking through and talking to psych the psychic Melinda. So we scheduled that for one day. And to be fair, the string pull could have been one day. Just the makeup effects could have been one day on a, on their own. And we we scheduled them for about four hours. So <laughs> when that hit, when we, we dived, I mean, it ended up being a 16-hour day. And believe it or not, everybody stayed in really good spirits. We had in and out. We got it done. But there was a point when we were getting through like the storytelling of dialogue and all of that. And it's like a full day has already happened. Like now we're going to get into the crazy makeup, heavy effects. And it was like a real come to Jesus. Oh my God. Are, what, what did we get ourselves into? Um, but we made the decision. We can't come back to this location. We don't have the money. Let's just get it done. So we dove in and we did it. Um, and you, I look at Frankie, he, he does a fantastic job, but 
on on set, I mean, we were like into our 15th hour, but it doesn't show on Frankie or, or Melinda or the makeup effects. So that was a, that was a tough one. When we got through it. Yeah, that was a brutal day. And then, like Brian said in post, like we we have this room at our at our Sunset Gower location for for the program. That's uh, it's kind of like a, a mini like dub space basically for for sound and, and mixing, and we pretty much lived in that space for like weeks on end mm. uh, to get the crayon into the space, working with sound, but uh, and just a lot of a lot of um, pickup stuff. We shot it like principal shooting was done like we wrapped in eighteen days, um, but then we had like day after day of of uh, pickup shots or a lot of VFX stuff. So there's this without giving too much. Sp- too many spoilers that at some point Frankie starts thinking he's seeing these portals, these uh, portals kind of appearing and it, trying to, to lock down the portal look. And, uh, and we, we're always trying to approach it as practical as possible, but a lot of reshoots with like, I have in my office right now, this fantastic, like big physical, hairy looking bubbling portal thing <laughs> that <laughs> looked, we, we loved it. And, but then it just wasn't working. And so we, then we, we have doing, you know, more stuff with kind of this black ooze and, so uh, just a lot of like reshoots and playing, I think, with that. I get, the post stuff really became a lot longer, I think, than any of us expected. Yeah. More trial and error, in other yeah. words. Yeah. 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 Film scheduling is a hell of a thing. Christy, yeah, uh, Christy could have helped you out yeah. on that day there. Yeah. She would have told you, <laughs> you know yeah. what? This is not going to take four hours. <laughs> it's, it's, it, but sometimes you only got four yeah, hours. Yeah, yeah, you got to figure out what you to do. You have to figure out how to do it. I, I, I remember while watching it, I, w- I was thinking, you know, this is like Clerks Gone Wrong. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. right? <laughs> I, I was talking to Charles a little early, and he told us yeah. about the process, told me about the process of getting a hold of Frankie. Yeah. People, you know, people are always interested. How do you get a movie star, television star, movie star, to be in your little independent film? Uh, talk to us a little bit about how you got Frankie. Well, that is all thanks to our casting director, Jeremy Gordon. So we were going to do like many, which I've done every time for short films before. I'll sit through and you know, you, you can cast in Los Angeles, you can cast it yourself. It's a lot of work, but you can do it. However, on this one, people smarter than us are like, this is a feature, you need to get a casting director. And we heeded that advice. So we found the right guy, uh, Jeremy Gordon, who has done a lot of work as a casting associate on like really big movies, but he's been in the last couple of years striking out as a casting director himself. Stri- not, not baseball striking out. <laughs> like Oregon Trail striking up. Yeah. Um, and and he was able to bring in get our number one get our script to so many agencies we could have never done. You know we could have never had that access. But he has those relationships, and it just so happened that as we were auditioning, a, real, a lot of really solid, great actors that are more like they're coming up in their career like TV co stars, building up that resume. Um, and as we were about to, we did like two weeks of auditioning and right when we were about, we felt really good about a choice for Jonathan, our protagonist, Jeremy said, I mean, talking 11th hour, Hey guys, hold on. I got a name for you. Frankie Muniz. And like, what are you talking about? Where has, where, where has Frankie been? I thought he was a car, a race car driver now. <laughs> <laughs> like it just, it, it, you know, we were so locked in. We had spent hours and hours our time really trying to make the right decision on Jonathan. And all of a sudden Frankie Muniz has dropped as a name and, um, having worked in distribution, I knew the importance of, um, name talent. So it was like, it, even though we were about to hire someone that day, uh, no, stop the, you know, stop the presses, bring in Frankie. Let's see what, you know, he can do. And he right away gave such an amazing read, only having the script for like, 24 hours and then eventually he had driven out from Arizona and um, so humble and like very excited about this project and he did he came back the second day and he owned it and it was like you know you've got to go with Frankie and it was a it was a last minute adjustment and our expectations of the look of the character and he, he has a more charisma and a bigger personality than we expected from Jonathan but that's okay because he made it a very unique, um, he, he, he made it his own, and we wouldn't be here without him right now. So it was a last-minute decision, and, uh, I, you know, Bunch, 
you, you can probably talk about how Frankie is kind of excited about the movie and how he's responded to getting the opportunity. Oh yeah. He's got, he, it's, it's awesome to see and to hear from Frankie, like how much he loves it and appreciated it. He always talks about how it's like, it's his favorite script and, and for him, it's it's a different character than he's ever played before. Oh, it, it ain't Malcolm in the Middle. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah that's for sure. <laughs> it's an interesting because because Charles, you 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 were saying that you know Frankie came in, did have a a different set of ideas about this guy than you guys were envisioning, and and, and, and I, you know I wanted to talk about this too. H- how did you make that decision to lean into what Frankie wanted to do, which meant leaning away from this idea that was already in your head? It, well, I mean, again, it, we for you know a few hours, like I was saying earlier, we we debated. We were like, I don't know, like he's against kind of how we all pictured it. But then we all like we slapped ourselves and said, this is Frankie Munez. This is he he has a name and a persona, uh, and and he's going to bring a cachet to the film that we would never get otherwise. And so, like, it's in the end, it was really just um, going, but going with you know Frankie Munez. People are going to know Frankie Munez. And the fact that he killed it in the auditions, like, mm. I mean, he he brought this energy that we just didn't, ex- we weren't just expecting, is all, and 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 he brought it. And then he, I mean, the film is Frankie, like it's he he really kind of owns the film, and 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 he, I think I think part of his uh, kind of background or people knowing him as persona as Malcolm in the Middle, like I think that helps endear audiences that that grew up knowing him as Malcolm. I think that it endears you to the character quicker mm. uh and i think you you feel more i think for his character knowing that in some ways you can kind of watch it as like a where is you know malcolm now story <laughs> uh, um and it's and he's not in a good place <laughs> I, I, it, w- there's also something though where especially where films like this are concerned because everything is about seeing the movie through his eyes you're completely immersed in his i mean he's in every single scene so if if he's cast wrong the movie doesn't work and if he's not on his game, the movie doesn't work. So, I mean, there's a certain anxiety, I think, as well from for both of you that you realize we, we if, if this isn't working, if this actor isn't working, if he's not there, we can't fix it in timing, we can't fix it in post, we can't fix it in the mix, there's no fixing it. I mean, that, that it's, it's, it's do or die, right? It's a lot of pressure. But, I mean, I'd say we, we pretty much knew from... We knew what we were going to be getting, I think, from the auditions. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I don't. I mean, Brian, do you feel differently? I don't, what are your thoughts on that? Well, from the design of the movie, um, when when it was originally conceived, like a decade ago, with my buddy Andy Warner, him and I, we knew we wanted to put this paranoia: is it real? Is it not real? Story together that was seen through one, you know, the protagonist's uh, point of view. So. We realized even back then, wow, you know, there's a lot of things. If you're going to tell a story this way, there's a lot of things you can't do. Um, and it's going to ride all on this character. So then when Rich, when I met Rich at Mount St. Mary's, like after, I was in the Army and used my GI Bill to go back to film school. That's how I met Bunce and Kaylee and, and Rich Hanley. The, the, the movie, the script kind of, um, I mentioned the script to Rich and he loved, he really liked it. So we decided to co-write it and make it a thesis project which is where we got uh, working with Kaylee and and uh, Bugs but at that again it was like wow this is this Jonathan guy is in every scene it's all through his perspective so we always knew that the onus was completely on Jonathan so when we went into the casting process we were very well, well aware of that challenge um, and knew that the Whoever we cast was going to have to be incredibly entertaining, intriguing, and even make the small moments um, interesting to watch. Because the guy, the guy's going to be on camera all the time, and he can't be doing backflips and, and big gunfights every single scene. There are no gunfights, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like it has to be. A guy, you just look at his eyes, and you're intrigued because he's going to have that much screen time. Everything he does needs to be intriguing, and Frankie has that. Well, you just look at Frankie, and you're like, "What's going on in his head?" Well, and on, and on the first, so there's one seat, one kind of pivotal point in the film where Frankie's character essentially has a mental breakdown. Kind of, like you you see him breaking on screen, and uh, and he's he's trying to explain what's going on to his friend, and he's losing it. He even calls it himself. He's like, "I know this sounds crazy. Like I sound like I'm crazy," and that was the first day. Like he shot that the first day, and so mm-hmm. if there's any doubt. 
about the intensity and, and, and what Frankie was going to be able to do. Like, the first day he brought it. We're like, all right, I mean, we're, we're in for the ride. Mm. Now, yeah. Brian, you, you mentioned uh, Rosemary's Baby early on, and I remember uh, uh, thinking, watching it, this is very Polanski-like, but it wasn't Rosemary's Baby that I was thinking of. It was The Tenant. Ah. So, because, because Polanski in The Tenant, uh, as an actor in his own movie, goes through a similar kind of a breakdown. Uh, and 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 finds things in the the teeth in the wall, you know. So I mean, there, there's a similar kind of a traje- trajectory. I'm curious, was to what degree was Polanski kind of a um, a, uh, a an influence on this overall? Big, you know, Repulsion, Rosemary's Baby, and The Tenant, for sure. All of them. I mean, they call that the Apartment Trilogy. Or yeah. Something yeah. To that effect. Um, definitely were inspirations. Um, and I mean, let's be honest. Those movies, we're not. I'm not the only one. It's like maybe, maybe he <clears throat> almost helped define that paranoia thriller right. you know, type type uh, feel. But what I what I loved about it is that those movies don't try to be horror, and it's surrounded. You know, you have this character who's really in crisis but surrounded by such vibrant, all the other characters are so vibrant. And there's a life. The movie doesn't have to feel at all moments like it's a horror movie. Like, you've got, you know, characters that are, that are funny, that are goofy, or are broody. They can be anything. And we wanted to make sure that all of our uh, supporting characters were living their own life. Mm. They're interesting to watch. Um, I think that's where the real thing that I got from Polanski is there's no wasted character. There's no yeah. one that just just walk in and out, you're done. Every character is thoughtful, even if they're just dropping a cup of coffee on the on the table. There's everybody adds something and it has an energy and a, and it feels full um, and dynamic. So that's what we really, really wanted to have that same experience where everyone you look at in our movie is like, ooh, are they in on it or oh, what are they all about? Or, what are, what are they up to? That's Terrific. Yeah. Guys, yeah. thank you thank you so much, uh, Brian Hansen, Charles Bunce, director and producer of The Black String with Frankie Muniz. It is Muniz. Can we get the pronunciation right? Because that's, it, it, it is, is that it? M- Muniz is how Muniz, we Muniz, Muniz, okay. I don't know if Frankie might come back and be like, I, you guys, know you've messed it up the whole I've, time. I Whenever I see him, I just call him Frankie Baby. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Whenever I see hey, right. Frankie Baby, what's up? Well, good luck with the film. It releases on DVD on the uh, 24th, uh, and uh, good luck with it. Now, going it's, it's, it's oh, going to be yeah. rounding about at some festivals and whatnot. We have a big audience oh, yeah. all kind of all over the country. Uh, hit, hit, a few, hit a few spots. So where, where um, the for the Los Angeles audience, Shriek Fest, on, um, is that that's Sunday, I think the 24th? 20... Ninth, right? This coming up September. Oh, oh September. Okay. September twenty ninth, right? As Shriek Fest, we've got GI the GI Fest down in San Diego, which is when are we? Is that Friday? Yep, that's that's we're doing that nine uh, twenty seven GI Film Fest down in San Diego. And we got for those. I don't know if you guys get people like you know east of the Rockies, but oh, yeah. uh, but New Orleans. We're playing on uh, Thursday at the New Orleans Horror Festival. Uh, on Thursday, the twenty sixth. Great, and um, and wow, well, there's there's a couple others that that may come through as well. Okay. Sweet. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, let us let us know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, let us know, and we'll keep the uh, we'll we'll announce it on the show as as they happen. Awesome. Perfect. Thank you guys so much for having. Thank us. you guys. Thanks. Thanks, Terrific. guys. Thank yeah. you, Brian. Thank you so much, guys. Yeah. All right, and now that that interview is over, we can say what we really think of Black String. <laughs> <laughs> it's fantastic, actually, is what we think it of it. It really is. Now, I'll tell you, uh, the uh, the Black String is a, is, uh, and again, with all conflict of interest aside, obviously, but if you're if you want to see how to put together a really cool, low budget, intelligent, yeah, uh, psychological horror film that. Um, that gets a lot. I mean, that does not look like it's low budget. It doesn't. It no. looks like they had a really decent budget, and it's well shot and it's well edited. And uh, Frankie does a terrific job. He really does. He just he brings that Polanski depth to it. And uh, it's not at all. It's not at all one of these kind of uh, quickie throwaway, 
low budget horror films that just come out on DVD all the time. It really has some some intelligence to it. And yeah. Well, I, I I hope people were paying attention. Basically, it was a ten year project. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That he worked on the concept for the script and worked all the way through through the grad school program. And you know, it took it took a decade uh, to get that thing done in a, in 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 a uh, decent and uh, good looking and good sounding sort of way. So these things take time. They unfortunately do. But it pays uh, off. But it does. It definitely does. So, uh, Frankie Munoz and the Black String, and uh, they've got a commentary on it with um, Brian and Charles as well. So, if you didn't get enough of them just now on the on the podcast, they uh, they do a commentary as well, and it's a really good commentary. Uh, there's featurette and some deleted scenes and alternate takes and uh, the usual uh, kind of extras on there, which will be more meaningful. If you've uh, if you've listened to the uh, the interview, mm-hmm. uh, so there is that. You know what? We're gonna we're gonna shift right now, and I'm gonna go through some music this week because there's a whole bunch of music, and uh, a lot of it is really, really, really worthwhile. I think all of it is worthwhile. Obviously, a lot of classical, but we also have uh, Teddy Pendergrass. If you don't know Teddy, me, Teddy, the, Teddy, 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 the rise, fall, and resurrection of Soul's sexiest superstar. It is kind of weird yeah. that he's fallen out of the conversation. Yeah. Teddy was a big deal when I was growing up. Oh, in the early 80s, oh, there was goodness. Teddy Pinnegrass. I mean, for, hey, look, if you were a, uh, a, a black uh, man of a certain age and you wanted to hang out with a black girl of a certain age, <laughs> you went and bought yourself this thing called a cassette. <laughs> Look it up, kids, with some Teddy Pendergrass on it. Yeah, you, you take take your girl to a Teddy Pendergrass concert. You're you're a boss. Yeah, yeah, he was that guy. It, it really, it, I mean, just such a it's so gifted. Uh, anyway, the um, this is basically the uh, the story of a man who was a a remarkable R and B figure for a very very long time. Well, before he began, because he was Harold no, Harold Melvin and the Blue Notes. Well yeah, before he was, yeah, he was he was actually be, be, believe it or not, and you, and you know from the fifties forwards, uh, and certainly with the advent of Motown, music was dominated by black artists. Oh, yeah. through, throughout the fifties and sixties primarily, and uh, you know there are so many who were so successful. It may come as a shock to people that Teddy Pendergrass was the first black recording artist to have. Five consecutive platinum albums. Yeah, I did not know that. Five. He I was the first. That. That's a. That's, that's a saying a lot. That's really, really saying a lot. And um, and then of course there there is and, and this isn't giving anything away, but uh, it all ended in 1982. Yeah, when he was he was he was on the cusp of of stardom that nobody had ever imagined, including even, a film career, including a film career, and uh, he was paralyzed in an accident. Yeah. And it's just it's just absolutely devastating. It's just so so devastating, um, and it doesn't really end there. There is a, a little a little coda to that, but it's it's a it's a really really wonderful wonderful disc. It's a it's Blu-ray. This has been at a number of festivals, and it is really worth checking out. Teddy Pendergrass, if you don't know me, the rise, fall, and resurrection of Soul's sexiest superstar. Uh, then we also have uh, Slash featuring Miles Kennedy and the Conspirators, Living the Dream Tour. This is a uh, CD set with a Blu-ray on it, which includes the uh, live in London and uh, behind the scenes stuff. The uh, you know, look, Slash isn't everybody's idea of a good time, but uh, he's he's a fixture and he's still around. And uh, if if you just want to see him just rip it and shred that guitar like nobody else does, uh, it's still a thing. Guitars are not as much of a thing now. They'll yeah. probably make a comeback someday, but Slash doesn't care. He's out there uh, ripping it up. Uh, and then we've also got, uh, while we're on the rock and roll thing, we've got a uh, film called a, a rockumentary. I don't really you know, like that <laughs> term, but whatever. That. This has also won a bunch of awards. It's called Mock and Roll. And um, this centers on a parody band called Liberty Mean uh, in Ohio. And... Um, uh, you know, I I can't say that this is uh the Spinal Tap level, um, but it's you know, if if that's an itch that you have and you need to scratch it constantly, and Harry Shearer is doing a a, a throwback uh, tour right now as well for you know his 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 Spinal Tap character. So anyway, throwing this in there just because we're talking about Slash Mock and Roll, kind of a you know uh. 
silly, silly wannabe low budget spinal tap type thing. Uh, it's got some interesting music in it. It's not great, but uh, yeah, you know, check it out if that if that's your your particular thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, then on the uh, on the classical music front, we have the absolutely amazing Ron Howard documentary Pavarotti. Uh, oh wow! Tim and I love this film. Yeah, we really do. Uh, I think this is uh, stands a really good chance of being in the Oscar mix. It's uh, it's a warts and all. It is. It's warts and all. It is. It's a straightforward biographical documentary about Pavarotti, archival footage, his marriage, his kids, his affairs, the whole thing, all of it, and um, his father. You know, that's where he got his love of opera yeah. from his dad. And uh, it is warts and all. I mean, he's he's an amazing figure, but he is not a perfect figure, and uh, this really uh, exposes it all. It is a, it is a fascinating look at it, what it means to be an artist, especially in the world of opera. So, uh, Ron Howard, not known as a documentarian, but this is on Blu-ray and DVD with a digital copy on it. Uh, from Lionsgate, that means the digital copy will be iTunes and Vudu, not on uh, Movies Anywhere, and uh, it is great. It is really, really a tremendous documentary. High, high, high praise. And they've done a great job of giving it all that that sheen so that it really pops on Blu-ray as well, even though a lot of the source material is standard def because Pavarotti, you know, in the old days of yeah. doing his PBS shows and whatnot, it's all, there's no HD there, but still looks really, really great in HD. Uh, and then uh, quick burning through a lot of the Naxo stuff here. We've got the uh, Berthold Goldschmidt opera Beatrice Cenci. Uh, that is very nice to to look at. I don't really understand the story, even after uh, watching it. It's a it's a, a whole kind of um, Catholic Church history thing, but it's with the Vienna Sim, uh, Sim, the Vienna Symphonic Orchestra, uh, conducted by Johannes Debus, and uh, that's on Blu-ray. We also have the Barber of Seville by Rossini. Uh, as performed at the Arena di Verona, and this is wonderful. This is with the uh, Arena di Verona orchestra, chorus, and ballet. Got to tell you, I just, I just enjoyed the fact that this is in that old, old arena in Verona, mm. and uh, it's, it's just, it, it's really quite a, quite an amazing place. It's a nicely staged version of the Barber of Seville, but as for the Barber of Seville. I can't really watch it as an, uh, as an opera because I've seen the Rabbit of Seville too many times. And I just picture Bugs Bunny, and uh, it just, uh, ah, it's too much. Uh, and as long as we're on the subject of the Arena di Verona, the uh, volume one of the Arena di Verona collection is also out, and that includes uh, Verdi's Aida, uh, Gounod's Romeo and Juliet, and Puccini's Turandot. And uh, again, all beautiful productions, beautifully staged, but you're watching it for that amazing arena in Verona. It's just, uh, it's extraordinary. It really is. It's just a wonderful venue. I could watch them do anything in that venue. Blue Note Records, Beyond the Notes, uh, is all about the, uh, if you know Blue Note Records, it's, a, it's an American jazz label. And uh, it was formed in the late 1930s by German Jewish refugees and uh, it emerged over subsequent years as, as really an iconic uh, label. And so this goes into the archival materials and interviews with the central figures and the usual documentary approach. But it's just such an interesting subject. There's nothing particularly remarkable about the way the doc- about this is put together, but it's, it's a great subject. Blue Note is an amazing label. And if you're not familiar with it, you, you will be after the end of, uh, of that. That's just really, really superb. A um, few more here, uh, almost all on the opera front. Madama Butterfly, Madame Butterfly, uh, as performed by the Glyndebourne Chorus and the London Philharmonic Orchestra. Very, very nice staging. Uh, I've, I've seen a few versions of this. The music is the thing. Puccini, can't really, you can't really go wrong. But this is a, this is a good staging. Uh, it doesn't really transcend the others. It's, it's just there. It, it, it measures up very nicely with them. Uh, Mozart's Don Giovanni from C Major and Rai Com. This is uh, also at the Arena di Verona with the Arena di Verona Orchestra and Chorus. Beautifully, beautifully done by no less than Franco Zeffirelli. Just want to point that out when he was still alive. Uh, Zeffirelli left us uh, recently, but this was uh, done in 2015, and uh, it is it is beautiful staging. Uh, Zeffirelli did as more operas than he did films, I think. Yeah. So. Uh, anyway, from uh, 2015, just before he that probably I may have been even the last thing that he did. So Mozart's G- Don Giovanni, 
Um, we also have uh, Puccini's Le Vili, Le, or Le Vigli, with the orchestra e coro and uh, Del Maggio Musicale Fiorentino. Um, the uh, I, I'm not terribly familiar with Le Vigli, Le Vili, uh, originally composed and performed in 1924, I, but it's fine. It's not the greatest Puccini, but it's it's fine. It's uh, it's good. Uh, let's see. We've also got uh, Richard Strauss's Salome. Really a very, very nice staging. Uh, conducted. This is the Vienna Philharmonic, conducted by Franz Welser Most. And, um, you know, it's a very mo- postmodern, modernist version of Salome. It's very uh, kind of aggressively minimalist, and it's fine. Uh, the music, again, is the thing here. Casella's, Alfredo Casella's La Donna Serpente. Um, not familiar with this at all. Don't particularly care for it. Don't really know what it's all about. Um, kind of gave up about a half an hour in. It's a little too weird for me. The uh, the, the beautiful serpent, I guess, is what it, it technically is. Uh, this is with the orchestra and chorus, Teatro Reggio Torino of Torino. And um, yeah, if you know what I'm talking about, you'll go then just go for it. I'm not; it's not my thing. Uh, and then the last three here are really, really wonderful. Tchaikovsky's Peak Dom, the Queen of Spades, with also with the uh, Vienna Philharmonic, is, and and Maris Janssen's uh, conducting it is absolutely wonderful. Um, it's you know Tchaikovsky's not known for opera. But this is amazing, and uh, Tchaikovsky's music really does lend itself to opera. Really, really beautiful. Might be the most enjoyable production of any of the operas that I've mentioned today. And then the uh, Verbier Festival, the 25th anniversary concert. Uh, the Verbier Festival and uh, with the Chamber Orchestra. It, this is a, um, a classical music events around the year have like a handful of very, very prominent festivals. And the Verbier Festival is one of the most prominent. It's only been around for 25 years, but it's really, really ascended to being a, a place where the very best musicians all want to go and perform. And the audiences love it, and it's absolutely wonderful. Um, Verbier, of course, is in Switzerland, for those who don't know. This was uh, uh, July of 2018, last year. And uh, some amazing performances here. The Brandenburg Concerto by Bach. Uh, Mozart's Ave Verum Corpus, uh, the Slavonic Dances by Dvorak. Really, really just lovely stuff. It's worth uh, worth checking out. It's a great festival and a lovely Blu-ray. And then the last one is from the uh, is Opus Arte, continuing to release some really, really great pro- uh, productions of uh, Shakespearean p- stage plays from the Royal Shakespeare Company. This is the uh, full collection of the Roman plays, which c- includes the four, Julius Caesar, Antony and Cleopatra, along with Coriolanus and uh, Titus Andronicus. It's a great quartet of, uh, of plays. They share only the Roman Empire and Roman history backdrop, but um, they're all really good. Even Titus Andronicus, which was Shakespeare's first play and uh, I'd say maybe even his worst. Yeah. But, um, I love what Julie Tremor did with it uh, back yeah. in the day with Anthony Hopkins. She f- it, it, and she, she filled a, yeah. in. She really filled it in yeah. with a lot of stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, Coriolanus also was a film. Uh, all of these have been made as films. But um, to see them... Ray Fiennes made a Coriolanus. A he did. Also years. not very good. Yeah. But but the staging of them here is is quite good. So it's it's worth worth checking out all of these. This is a really, uh, especially for Shakespeare buffs, great box set. The Roman plays from the Royal Shakespeare Company, Coriolanus, Titus Andronicus, Julius Caesar, and Antony and Cleopatra. All righty, right. All right. Uh, Let's get into new movies. Well, I got a couple of new movies and then a, and then a couple of docs we'll che- uh, that we'll check out. Let's start with uh, X Men: Dark Phoenix. W- what a mess! <laughs> I didn't even see it. I you know I had to see it for the show. You yeah, know, and, and, but well, I was going to see it anyway. You know, more or less the culmination of the yeah. whole. Yeah. Although Logan should have been. But here's the problem with this with the, this series, this X Men series, because they tend to do that thing in the X Men series where they go backwards into the past. Right, X Men, you know, Days of Future Past, all of that kind of stuff, and and they do things in the X Men saga, and then when they make a new movie, they do not account for the things that they did in that movie that was set in the past. They just ignore it as if some stuff that happened in that movie that you set in 1988 didn't happen in the 15 films that have been made since you know 1988. It's 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 frustrating. It's really irritating. And really irritating. They do it with this movie. 
And if you've seen it, you know exactly what I mean. If you haven't, you, you can check it out on this. Uh, directed by Simon Kinberg. Here's the thing about Simon. Simon's not a director. Primarily a writer. Writer, producer kind of guy. Yep. Goes uh, Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Go back, and you go back you know, you, uh, all the other X-Men. He's a producer guy, writer guy on all of that stuff. Deadpool, producer, all that kind of stuff. What he is not is a director, and it shows up all over this movie. Mm. This guy is a producer and a writer and not a director. So if, if, uh, Interesting. If, if, just if you, different skill sets. Just a different some people have them and some don't. Yeah, yeah, and he didn't know how to pull off. Anyway, this thing is, uh, this Blu-ray is packed with all sorts of uh, deleted scenes and features and uh, the rise of the Phoenix and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, audio commentary by Simon and, and a few other people. But it is just a, a, extremely disappointing uh, what they do over there with the X-Men, except for Logan. Logan should have been it. So not, not worth the 4K, but is it worth a rental? It's worth a rental, perhaps. If, if, you, if you simply want to understand how to make a mess of a series, <laughs> where you're not, then go ahead and uh, rent that thing. Uh, Luke Bisson, Anna is the name of this movie. Luke Bisson. Yeah. Luke. Yeah. Isn't he Luke. just remaking Femme Nikita? I, 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 Luke, it's a film about this young, beautiful Russian uh, model who has within her the ability to unlock her skills as an assassin, one of the most dangerous assassins ever. And there are all these other assassins, and she's fine, and she goes around kicking ass and taking names. Are we going to yeah, get Anna? I've seen v- this movie five times. Are we going to get Anna V. Nikita? <laughs> that would be kind of cool. Like <laughs> Alien versus Predator, and then the winner of that goes against the winner of Alien versus <laughs> Predator, and the winner of that goes to. Uh, I don't know. What are you going to do? What do you, but he gets a cast. He gets a cast. He's got Luke Evans. He's got Celia and Murphy. He's got Helen Mirren. Yeah. But they're making the same movie that was made 15 mm. years ago. Cut it out, Luke. Uh, now we have Dolph Lundgren in a film called Tracker, which is actually not a bad film at all. Uh, basically, he's this guy who took his wife and daughter on a vacation in Italy 10, 15 years ago. They get kidnapped. Uh, all kinds of things go bad. They're, they're, they're killed. It's 10 years later. It's mm. a phone call from a cop in that small town in Italy. Thinks he might have an idea of what happened to his family. He goes back. By the time he gets there, the cop, the detective, has committed suicide. Something is awry. Something is awry. Luke decides that this time he's going to figure out what went down. And he uses his skill as a hunter and a tractor to kill a whole bunch of people because he's uh, Dolph Lundgren. <laughs> that's, that's what he does. This is actually pretty good. I rather enjoyed it. Uh, in, in the mode of uh, the, the, all the, the Taken films, you know, except for more revengey than those, per se. A couple of quick docs. This is one uh, was from the director of uh, Gleason, uh, yeah. about the football player. Uh, executive produced by hip-hop star J. Cole. This is a film about these two young black men, Darcel and Darnell. They follow these kids for eight years as they grow up in Omaha, Nebraska. Hmm. Black family growing up in fairly ne- racially... Uh, 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 Corn country. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Now, this is interesting because you know, uh, 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 black families, black folk have been in Om- Omaha going back. Uh, 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 Malcolm X yeah. was born in Omaha. His father right. was a preacher in Omaha. That history... Uh, and and what it has meant and what it means to grow up as a young black man. These are two young twin black boys growing up in Omaha. Is what this movie is about, uh, and it's a fascinating, a fascinating film. Hmm. Uh, how much of those the legacy of uh, things like what happened to Malcolm X's yeah. father? His father was hung, yeah, lynched uh, in Omaha. Uh, some of the first filmmakers, some of the first African American black filmmakers, came out of Omaha. Yeah, uh, the Johnson brothers, Noble Johnson and his brother George Johnson, created the, the Lincoln Motion Picture Company. Yeah, in Omaha. Before yeah, they came here. So it's a fascinating film uh, out of Omaha about these young twin boys growing up in Omaha. Outstanding. Um, uh, we we lost Toni Morrison not too terribly long ago. Yes, and thank God she was able to be a part of this documentary. Yeah, yeah, I think I think yeah. we lost her maybe about a month after about this. A, about a month after the documentary came out. Yeah, Toni Morrison. I uh, Toni Morrison, the pieces I am. It's an absolutely it's, it's beautiful. It, it is deep dive into uh, Toni didn't even start writing. She was an editor. She was an editor. She yeah. was, she was uh, over forty yeah. when she decided to actually start writing. Created a new voice, a new genre. This film goes deeply into that. How for years and years, how eventually other writers had to shame the Nobel Committee into ultimately giving her yep. a Nobel Prize because she probably should have won a Nobel Prize mm-hmm. 20 years before, you know, bluest eye or something yeah. like that. They had to shame them into ultimately giving her that prize. Any, uh, a beautiful film, Walter Mosley, so, uh, Oprah Winfrey, so many voices from that Everybody, diaspora. and yeah. especially yeah. Her, her longtime friend and editor yeah. with whom she worked uh, as an editor for many, many years has some wonderful insights. But what, what I most love about this Hilton, doc... Hilton Halls. Yes, 
What I most lo- love about this doc is the insight into her creative process. Yeah. Because if you're a writer, if you're any kind of a writer, if you're a creative writer, if you're a, a, a nonfiction writer, if you're anybody who struggles with the written word, um, she has an approach to that because she's been an editor. Yeah. Right? And, and, and it's a different skill set to be an editor versus a writer. To have both those skill sets is a godsend. Yeah. And so she is able to approach the written word in a way philosophically I've never seen anyone else do. Yeah. And I was almost in tears watching this because there are moments where she will say something about writing and the writing process, and I just started to tear up, and I was like, no one's ever been able to articulate that before. Like, I know what that feels like. Yeah. yeah. I know what that feels like. And she just put it into words and it went, and it just goes right to your heart. It is a, it's it really a, a beautiful, beautiful documentary. Yeah, I can't, striking, can't recommend right. it highly enough. Special features, deleted scenes, and, uh, and, and several other things. So, you know, yeah, a, 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 a wonderful, wonderful homage. So a few other new films. Uh, let me let me put the uh, the DVDs out here. Uh, well, one DVD and one Blu-ray uh, that are kind of a little bit off the beaten path. Um, the Adventures of Dalian Spanky. That is the name of a film, folks. The Adventures of Dalian Spanky, which happens to co-star Denise Richards and Trace Adkins. What? How does this happen? Um, okay, so this is this is based presumably on a true story I never heard of mm. about a dog and a pony who were best friends. An actual dog and pony show. Actual dog and pony show. An honest to goodness, down to earth dog and pony show. And uh, it became like some kind of an online viral sensation or something. Uh, you know, Jack Russell Terrier and a little miniature horse. It's not like a full. It's not like the. You know, it's not like a a a a, a great a Saint Bernard and a Clydesdale. That would be. <laughs> hey, there you go. There's an idea for a movie. No, these are little things. It's a little Jack Russell Terrier and a little miniature horse, which you can take on the plane now. By the way, if it's a support animal, you yeah. can bring your miniature horse on the plane. Or to, or to Disneyland. I don't even want to talk about this. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it, it, it actually winds up being, despite all my mockery of the concept, it winds up being a really sweet film. And uh, it's all about the, you know, how, the, how the, these animals came together and these two uh, half-sisters who, you know, have all these family struggles and their dad has died. And, you know, it's a, it's a, it, it, it really is a family story. And the animals are part of the family. And the animals are also kind of therapy for the loss. And... Honestly, once you once you watch it and you realize how sweet it is in its core, uh, you realize that that's why Denise Richards and Trace Atkins did it because you know they probably thought, "Are you kidding me?" And then they read the script and they thought, "Oh, that's really sweet." Oddly enough, you know what's missing from this? Yeah. The dove seal. <laughs> really? Yeah. You, nor- think, you think the dove seal I, would the, be right that on thing, that thing? We 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 get like a dozen movies a week that have the dove seal on it. And I get this. And I'm like, there's oh, that's some, just there's like something a- in that movie that the dove people mm, didn't approve. I don't the, know. Yeah, I wonder what the deal is there. Anyway, there's that. Then we also have uh, Arctic, A R T I K, which is a real has some really uh, kind of creepy artwork on it. And this is a serial killer. Um, uh, this is kind of a serial killer story. It is grueling and it is creepy. It's a little bit cheap, uh, but it winds up kind of rectifying that at the end and becomes a better movie than it really has any business business being. It's from Epic, and um, this is about a uh, a serial killer and his son, and uh, it's very very disturbing. And there's a comic book angle to it that's a little bit tweaked. And it it it's you know it, you you do go through beats with this thing you'll you'll like it for a minute and then you'll think oh now it's taken a turn that I don't really approve of and then it writes itself again and you go well that's really interesting and intelligent I wish it was more intelligent than it is because it had promise but it's certainly better than than eighty five percent of what normally comes out in that genre for sure and then uh, the last two here kind of uh, a list independent Blu Ray releases this week a score to settle is yet another Nicolas Cage movie, uh, which is better than what he's been doing lately. It's a revenge tale. It's pretty formulaic. It's pretty straightforward. But it has a better cast than a lot of what he's done lately. Uh, Benjamin Bratt's in it, who always kind of upscales everything that he's in. And um, Sean Koo is not a bad director. And as as, as far as revenge films go, and especially as far as Nick Cage revenge films go, Mm. it's, uh, you know, he's he's an ex-con and he's got to, you know, reconnect with his kid and then also, you know, kind of get some payback. And um, 
Yeah, it it for for a genre formula film, he does a better. He's not overacting for a change. It's kind of like the old Nick Cage. Yeah. So he, you know, no, he not, has not Mandy. Not Mandy. So sometimes I think he tends to have uh, better directors that just know how to sort of take him back down to earth. I miss the old Nick Cage. So it's nice even in a mediocre movie when that comes back. And then lastly, what an odd movie. Mary Magdalene. Uh, they almost didn't send this to us. Uh, we, had, we had to kind of beg them for it a little bit. The, uh, Mary Magdalene is, uh, was touted rather substantially at a certain point, And then everybody kind of ran the other way. Joaquin Phoenix, who you know is, is apparently going to be an Oscar nominee again for Joker, mm. has anyone ever played the Joker and Jesus in the same year? Is he the first one? <laughs> it's I, got to, I, I'm, I'm going to say yeah. Uh, probably. Uh, I'm going to go with yeah. Yeah. First, one. Uh, first guy to play Joker and Jesus in the same year. Uh, so Joaquin, I, I haven't seen Joker yet, but you haven't seen. It? Haven't seen it yet. I haven't seen Not it yet, yet, by the way. And I, you know, I'm here and I see the the, the, the one Mark covered. Yeah. And when he, I it better be good. To knock Jack Nicholson out of the box. Yeah. <laughs> Jack Nicholson's my Joker, dude. Yeah. Jack Nicholson. I, I, yeah, I know the boy Heath and, the, yeah. and all that, but I'm sorry. It was always Jack for me. Still Caesar Romero for me. Still Caesar. Yeah, yeah still see, Caesar. We're old school. Uh, but anyway, so Joaquin Phoenix plays Jesus. He's too old to play Jesus, by the way. He's a little bit older than 33. Yeah. And uh, Rooney Mara plays Mary Magdalene. It's suitable because they're a real-life couple. So there's a lot of sort of implied... Uh, and not so implied stuff going on here. Um, how accurate is it? Now, I am something of a nerd for Jesus movies, most of which are terrible. So I'm always looking for something that is more down to earth, more more sort of in locked into what scholars uh, believe. And there aren't very many of them. There aren't any of them, really. However, uh, looking at it through the eyes of Mary Magdalene, interesting approach. Does it fully work? In fits and starts, uh, it, it 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 takes a lot of liberties. Uh, Joaquin Phoenix insisted on taking a lot of liberties. Um, Chiwetel Ejiofor playing um, the Apostle Paul. Uh, you know, I mean, no, no, um, <laughs> yes, no. I, 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 Great I, performance by him, by the way. It's a good performance, but no, but but I know, you know, I know we can we can we can stretch a lot. But see, Joaquin Phoenix playing Jesus also yeah, no. We're, we're already no, so he's, we're he's, already so, no. So anybody so. can play you can play the other guy. Yeah, uh, Tahar Rahim is actually the the best thing in this, to be honest. Uh, but most people here don't necessarily know who he is. You so. know that, that film had a real sort of, and it came out. Uh, I guess it was a little bit. But after the whole sort of Me Too yeah. dynamic, yeah, which is kind of a Me Too thing going on in that movie, because you know, basically the apostles are kind of, kind of they're kind of messing with yeah. Mary, not being cool yeah. with, the, with, with the girl, you know, yeah. and she already has all the issues with the, with the with the dad and all that kind of stuff. In the film, she goes to Jesus. Like Jesus is HR or something like yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> I know, and I know. She's like, Yo, Jesus. <laughs> The guys are not being cool. Can you rein them in? <laughs> you know, and I'm like, that's what, I'm like, I, I don't know, guys. That never happened. We're insinuating a whole lot of stuff. A lot, a from lot from the 21st century. An awful lot <laughs> into this movie. So uh, you get interviews and featurettes and behind the scenes stuff on here, which is fine, which is fun. Uh, I'm not going to not recommend the film, but it does come with some big reservations. Yeah, big reservations. Uh, Tim, you got some PBS stuff. Uh, yeah, yeah, some 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 really interesting sort of doc stuff, including, of course, we're 50, 50 year anniversary uh, of Apollo Eleven. There has been no shortage of recommend uh, uh, Just of keeps films. On, keeps on trucking. Keeps on, but you know what? What's uh, particularly these docs? Every single one of them has something new in it. Yep. Every single one of them has something to tout that we yeah. have never seen or heard or something before it's constructed in a particular way. Every one of the docs is better than that 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 feature film First Man. Yeah. Every one of the docs True. is better than the feature film. This one is 8 Days to the Moon and Back the Inside Story of Apollo 11. Uh and what this has is uh hours of access to classified cockpit audio recorded by the astronauts themselves uh, that has never been heard before. Even in that doc that came out a little bit earlier this uh, this summer, that, which had hours and hours of, uh, of, of 35 millimeter and 70 millimeter footage, which also had never uh, been seen before. You just It seems like it's one of the, it's almost like World War II. Uh, you can, the, the deeper you dig into the space program, uh, the more, if, and I do love that the um, that filmmakers, that the uh, folks who were running the program had the presence of mind some 50 years ago to use film and audio and videotape to record every possible moment of this undertaking that they could so that we have that record now. And I cannot understand how there are still people out there 
who are deniers. It's a little weird. That's it's why a, that's why every once in a while, just to make myself feel good, I will put on that YouTube video of uh, Buzz Aldrin clocking that dude. <laughs> yeah, it's, like, it's just so great. The guy goes run, he, it, and it's beautiful. If you haven't seen it, it's great because this guy he's always harassing. You know, he's a, he's a conspiracy theorist. And he's always harassing you know astronauts and whoever, and he's got his own camera guy. Yeah. And he's saying to the guy, he's like, oh, okay, there he is. Hey, we're, okay, we're going to really corner Buzz Aldrin. And his camera guy, like, they run across the street, and the camera's following him. And uh, he runs up to Buzz Aldrin, and he's like, oh, you didn't really walk on the moon, did you? And Buzz, just, Buzz Aldrin, who's like 80 <laughs> years old at the time, and he just, he's like, whap, and he nail, clocks him in the face. It's a beautiful thing. <laughs> it's a truly it's beautiful just, thing. You know, and Go get him, Buzz. Buzz, you so earned that, man. <laughs> you went to the moon and back. You, you were the only reason you were not the first man on the moon was because they knew that you were a hothead, yeah. and they didn't kind of want to reward that hotheadedness. But you know what? You were the second man, and damn it all, Neil Armstrong is gone. And if anybody's going to hold it down, you hold it down. Somebody questions that, you let them have it. You have earned that right. To Buzz, he'll punch you in the face. I, I had the wonderful um, uh, opportunity to interview Buzz. Uh, in, his, in his condo, Buzz. Can you imagine somebody person? trying to trying to bring him oh. up on assault charges? Uh, the, the judge would look at you and go. <laughs> Buzz Aldrin, man. What the hell's wrong with you? You should be proud. Be Buzz proud. Aldrin you got, punched you, got, you in your face, your <laughs> stupid face. It's like it's like it's like what Dave Chappelle says in his in his in Sticks and Stones, where where it's so politically incorrect, but it's so funny. He says, you know, I don't think Michael Jackson molested those kids, but if he did, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's Michael Jackson. <laughs> yeah, hey, hey. What, what was that kid wearing? <laughs> um, uh, what do we got here? We got uh, when whales walk. Uh, when whales walk, journeys into the deep. This is a yeah. fascinating PBS documentary uh, about an epic sort of evolution uh, through um, sea life, uh, uh, reptiles, and mammals that, that uh, many millennia again uh, walked around as dinosaurs and birds. It's, it's just wonderful, wonderful sort of conflagration of where birds and, uh, and whales and crocodiles and all of these things uh, were all sort of the same thing. Uh, many, many, many years ago. This is, a, this is really just a great film. Lots of fantastic 3D animation in this. Uh, and it's just an exciting sort of explanation of where things came from um, and, and, and a sort of imaginative, speculative sort of imagination of what these creatures might have looked like uh, many, many, many millions of years ago. And I just, I just think it's great. I love all of these things. And uh, you should check it out. This one's from two th 2009, and it's really, really good. Uh, Jan June, June 4th, 1989. It's the day that the uprising in Tiananmen Square came to an end uh, when the Chinese government uh, unleashed the tanks uh, and the soldiers and killed several thousand people. I remember watching the Tiananmen Square uprisings on television and on the news, they were covered by the news, and there was this brief moment when we thought that perhaps there might be this sea change yep. in China. And, yep. and that, uh, but the Chinese government put it into all of that quite brutally on June 4th. 1989. Uh, Tiananmen, People versus the Party, that's what this film is all about. Uh, and it's a perfectly fascinating film to watch, particularly in the context of where we see China is today, which of course is still a communist uh, totalitarian nation, yet not the communist totalitarian nation that it was not in 1989 and, and, and before. It's yeah, not. not they are rich people in China. They, they are not practicing uh, Marxist economics, but the authoritarian ideological social control end of it is still very much it's there. It's still very yeah. much there. Still yeah. very much that system, yeah. yeah. Uh, but you know, you can make some money in China. So any of Absolutely fantastic uh, a miniseries there. World War Speed. This is a very, very interesting doc. We, of course, we know that the Russians used, uh, the, the Russians and the Germans, for that matter, particularly the Germans, used all kinds of methamphetamines, uh, particularly toward the end of the war, to keep their soldiers fighting uh, and awake uh, and, 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 and engaged in battle. We know, for that matter, that Hitler did too. Yep. What we did not know is that so did the British and the Americans. Mm -hmm. um, and some of the very original pharma, pharmacological, particularly as we look at the sort of Oxycontin uh, uh, yep. epidemic that we're going into now, it began way back then when they started experimenting 
with all sorts of drugs to keep American soldiers and British soldiers awake and alert, flying those B-52s. Yeah. Uh, uh, and it's just, you know, it's an amazing thing. A lot of soldiers came back from the war. Messed up. Hooked. Addicted. Before we yeah. knew what it was. It wasn't like yeah. after Vietnam or even after uh, True. Was, uh, you know, some of the more recent wars. We didn't know what that was at the time. Uh, but it was actually something that we did. It's called methamphetamines. And, and yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, an amazing story. Yet again, another amazing story coming out of World War II. It just never seems to, never seems to stop. Uh, Ancient Skies, the TV miniseries, uh, PBS TV, beautiful CGI landscape footage uh, of some of the world's most astounding astronomical artifacts. So they're they're, they're taking a look at the sky using many of the uh, the world's largest radio and other telescopes all over the planet, uh, Mirasibo and everything else. Uh, and, and, and doing all of this imaging of the skies, and then they, they're using CGI to sort of enhance these images to, 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 for ever greater impact and effect. Again, just an absolutely wonderful, wonderful uh, documentary. And I love the way um, it talks about what the skies, what the cosmos, what these ancient sort of scenes looked like thousands upon thousands of years ago. They can map back and tell you that if you were looking at this sky... 5,000 years ago, this is what you would have seen. Oh, that's great. And I, just I love, love, that. That. I I just love, love that. I love that stuff. I love that. thing. PBS. I sit there, I, you know, I, all that stuff. That's why I, I watch those animated maps that show you, like, borders changing yeah. over, over 5,000 years. You know, the, all those kinds of animated through the time maps. I love all that. Yeah, where that river used stuff. to run. And, yeah, and, 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 I love all that stuff. Before there was a mountain there. Yeah. Uh, Ken Burns, who, have, who of course, uh, is the nation's uh, a documentarian, yeah. has created country music. Of course, he did jazz, yep. baseball. I mean, we know that. Yep. Ken Burns. So, I, look, the thing that the, these films that Ken uh, makes, they're, uh, relatively speaking, exhaustive about the subject. Yeah, he's pretty much making them the same. Been making them the same way uh, his entire career. Uh, it, they're very f- straightforward docs uh, with that sort of Ken Burns effect and the talking yep. heads, and it's very clean and it's very organized. And, and but but you know, I think that I deeply appreciate that about a Ken Burns doc. Yeah, uh, I do too. He's not trying to do anything fancy. He's not trying to remake the way documentaries are made. He's simply trying to be exhaustive and complete. He wants about he, the subject. He's he's uh, he's delivering uh, uh, material in a way that he understands we are most acclimated to receiving it. Yeah, he's he, it's very it's very easy to watch a Ken Burns film and it just kind of it just sort of washes over you and he he's really mastered that in a beautiful way. It, yeah. it feels you don't you don't see the technique you don't yeah. see the work. It's very polished and smooth. Yeah, and, and yeah. it's funny how many filmmakers have taken up this. This is a really fascinating. Uh, what I love that he does here is he looks at it so comprehensively that you come to understand that music in America, country music in America, is Native American music. It's African American music. All of that. It's all. It's all of that. Yeah. Uh, uh, there's elements of jazz and in in all of these through lines. And when you listen to this music and you hear some of that old school, I'm talk, talking Porter Wagner type country music with a little bit of yodeling yep. and all of that. Yep. And you go back and you listen to some of those Native American chants from those uh, those Native American tribes that were spotted all over uh, the, the Midwest and uh, in, in, in the, the, yeah, the, uh, Florida, mm-hmm. the Alabamas. And you listen to that and you overlay that with some of that country music and you realize, oh, my goodness. You know, I didn't even know I you, were that how these things were really all sort of one thing. And it's a really, really great doc. It'll if you think that country music is something dumb and you don't like, uh, look at this film, and I think you'll come away with with it. You might not come away with loving country music, but you're going to come away from it understanding country music and all of the music and where it sort of comes from. Beautiful, it's much, it, much better. Yep, it's it's a, an un- unusual subject for him too. I wouldn't have normally expected him to do that. But. Yeah. And then we've also got uh, some uh, PBS Kid vid here from PBS Kids. Uh, the first one is the Berenstain Bears Treehouse Tales, Volume 1. I used to call them the uh, Berenstain Bears. They're apparently not Jewish. Uh, but Steve, I'm not sure not Baron Stein. Stain really. Now I'm picturing something else. So, <laughs> um, but anyway, the uh, Treehouse Tales uh, is a, an awful lot of Baron Stain bears. I don't particularly love the show, but and my daughter doesn't. It's like a little too arcane for her. But uh, 26 episodes here, and uh, they're all you know these sweet bear family and the lessons they learn, and 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 there it is. Um, so. 
I, I there's nothing else really to tell you. It's just 26 hours and five hours worth of Berenstain Bears. That floats your boat. Um, a little bit more my speed is uh, Dinosaur Train. Dinosaurs, big and small. Dinosaur Train is a terrific show. My daughter watched this continually when she was really small. Still really responds to it. Still likes it. And if you don't know it, it's basically the story of a, uh, a dinosaur family that uh, lives in a world that's a little bit like uh, Zootopia. And, you know, dinosaurs, are they, they have a civilization. They talk and they travel, and there's a dinosaur train where they go places. And this is all as a pretext for a paleontologist who I think co-created the show to give you little intermittent lessons every once in a while on different types of dinosaurs and what it was really like. Fully educational, really smart, comes from the Henson Company, and uh, it's it. They're well written. They're well animated. It's a really sharp show. It's and it's it's exactly what parents should want their kids watching. Uh, Ten episodes here, including a couple of two parters. Mom was a kid once, and a brand new species, which are both outstanding, absolutely outstanding. Uh, and then uh, there's a few others that are really good. We're not all dinosaurs. Don's holiday. Uh, how many horns? Really, really, really fun stuff. But it's those two big two parters that are terrific. Mom was once a kid, or mom was a kid once, and a brand new species. Really, really good stuff. Fantastic. Uh, do some of these. Classically, yeah. Let me let me hit some uh, foreign. Let me knock out some foreign stuff first. I also want to make uh, make mention for people who are fans of foreign. You know, Music Box Films uh, releases a lot of really great foreign stuff, including a lot of stuff that they pick up at the Colcoa Fel- uh, Film Festival, the French Film Festival here in Los Angeles. Which Com- coming I'm, up soon. Coming up, I'm moderating uh, the uh, the uh, delegation panel next week, and uh, it's a really good lineup. Normally, we're we're in April for the Colcoa Festival. This year, we're at the the uh, in the fall because. Uh, the DGA Theater, where they have them, has just been remodeled. Mm. So it's been remodeled all year. We're going to get a great, great new experience in that theater. But also, Music Box Films has launched a streaming service. And uh, it's uh, Music Box Direct. It's really, really worth checking out. Uh, it's only $5 a month, and that's a total bargain. If I mean, it, I know this stuff can all add up, but if you really like their library, you're going to want to check this out. Ida... Uh, the the girl with the dragon tattoo series. Um, you know, Ida won the Academy Award. Uh, th- these are all part of their um, their library, and it's a really impressive library. They've really done a very good job of uh, putting it together so far. And uh, I would say definitely go and check out uh, mu- go to musicboxfilms.com and read more about it and see if this is something that you want to uh, you want to sign up for. There's a seven day trial code when you go to mu- uh, musicboxfilms.com. And um, so, you know, they'll let you uh, have a full week of kind of exploring the library. I think it's a really great service, and uh, I think it's worth uh, really worth checking out. So big push there for Music Box Films. And uh, let me hit a few foreign things, and then I'll, uh, I'll turn you over to a couple of those classics. Um, from Wellgo, we have Kung Fu League, which I actually had a really uh, a, a good time with. Uh, Kung Fu films have diminished in recent years. Especially the ones that uh, that come out of China, which is everybody who used to make films in Hong Kong, and now they've all gone Mandarin speaking as opposed to Cantonese, and it just isn't the same thing anymore. But every once in a while, something will really, really work beautifully. And this is from Jeffrey Lau, the director, and it's in Mandarin, but it feels like a Hong Kong film. It's really smart, it's really sharp, it's really fun, and it's a great cast. Especially, look, three of these people. Not legends. Uh, Danny Chan, Andy On, Dennis Toad, not legends. Vincent Zhao, big legend, because he stepped into the Once Upon a Time in China series momentarily, briefly, when Jet Li stepped away. And uh, he is for real. He's done a lot of great movies in the 90s. He's timeless. He's, he's ageless. He's a really, really sharp guy. Uh, so Kung Fu League is, a, is an awful lot of fun. And then also, worth checking out, is uh, Intimacy which is uh, from the director Yi Chun Jang. This is only on DVD. This is from Indie Picks. Uh, you can also watch it on their Prime Video channel on, uh, on Amazon. Uh, this is about... Uh, this is a very artsy film, but really very affecting, about two young people trying to sort of find their path in life while living in Shanghai. And uh, it's a character study. 
It is a look at alienation in modern day China in a way that I'm surprised they actually were able to get the film made because it's not that flattering and it asks some very difficult questions. But they got it made and it's uh, it's really quite a beautiful film. Uh, check it out. It's called Intimacy. Uh, I want to do, do a few yeah. of these. Yeah, Come do on. a few of those. All right, let's get at some of this sort of classic y type stuff, starting with Moonchild, 1989 film. Uh, it's sort of a cult classic, this movie. Totally. Uh, about this African tribe that believes that a white child, uh, a moon child, a child from the moon, will come and, be, and yep. become their god. And, and this little white boy who's living in Europe uh, with this sort of scientific organization, uh, he has extrasensory perception. He comes to believe that he is the child who's meant to become the moon child for this African tribe. And it's about his, his uh, escaping the scientific cult and traveling across two continents to engage with it. It's quite a film. Uh, uh, the, the 1989 from Spain. Um, uh, 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 Augusti Villaronga is the name of the director. It's really an astounding film uh, with all sorts of metaphorical sort of uh, things going on in it. It's really lo lovely. Special features here include a high definition <laughs> transfer from the original 35 mil mil print and an interview with the director. It's a good movie. I I, I saw this movie back in 1989. Cult epics. Kind of kind of a cult. Cult epic. epics really. Uh, they they keep coming up with really interesting stuff. Uh, and then uh, 1990, one of the first films that I did the junket for was Nicholas Rogue's film, <laughs> The Witches. <laughs> Which I surprisingly like more than most Nick Rogue films. Yeah, well, Nick, most yeah. Nick Rogue's films are weird. This yeah. is weird, too, but it's based on the Roald Dahl uh, the yeah. book, so he has to sort of like follow the script. Wonderful performance from Angelica Houston. Uh, it's about a little boy who comes across a convention of witches. He gets turned into a mouse, but he still has to, to, to thwart the witches in their dark undertaking. This is really great. Lots of practical effects in this film. Uh, with the little boy's witch face and all that kind of stuff, and kind of scary. Yeah, this is not for this is not no. for the faint of heart, and certainly not for small small children. It's rated PG. It is rated PG, but I don't know. Measure your kid before you yeah. show him witches. <laughs> know where know where the, your kid is coming from. 1990s film. Uh, that's from the Warner Archive collection. Betty Davis, uh, Jezebel. Uh, uh, this look. This is one of the greatest Betty Davis films ever made. Uh, Louisiana Henry yeah. Fonda in the film is fantastic. William Wyler, uh, Betty Davis at the top of her game, playing that character that Betty likes to be. Yeah, uh, yeah, beautiful stuff. Uh, and, also from the Warner Icon. And and uh, I think Jezebel is a better period film of its type than most of the other movies of that time. I would say even more so than something like Gone with the Wind. I think there is stuff in Jezebel that is um, that that stands the test of time a little better. Yeah, I yeah. think so. Yeah, that classic Betty performance. All right. Thank you, everybody. That's it for us this week. We will be back, we will be back next week. Uh, and uh, in the meantime, thank you to Charles Bunce and to Brian Hansen for uh, in, be, doing the interview with us for The Black String. And we wish them well with their festivals. And meanwhile, the short film Refugee that, uh, that I was producer on, that my wife was producer on, uh, that is currently in uh, Oscar qualifying release here in Los Angeles at the Royal in West Los Angeles, 4 p.m., Every day until the 26th. If you're in Los Angeles, please come down and see it. You might bump into us. We're going to be there uh, around 4 p.m. just about every day or most days. So Refugee is the short film. Hope you come and see it. Tim's going to finish his film soon, too. Yeah, yep, so yep, we're going to have good stuff. There, All right, everybody. Have a great week. Thank you.